in the programme. Do book in now, though, for our hashtag Just Ask Unbelievable Conference 2018, Saturday the 19th of May at premier.org.uk slash just ask. You're unbelievable. Well, I'm really looking forward to today's edition of Unbelievable because we're going to that big theme, Jesus mythicism, and we're talking to one of the biggest players in that field, Richard Carrier, on the programme today. Uh, he's coming on to debate, did Paul believe in a real or a celestial Jesus? Uh, this is going to the core of uh, Richard Carrier's thesis on why he doesn't believe Jesus was a real, physical, flesh and blood human being. And we're going to hear him explaining that uh, in the course of today's programme. Richard Carrier has been on the show a number of times with me before debating this and other subjects. Um, but uh, it's good to revisit this. And uh, Richard Carrier, really one of the foremost voices in the Jesus mythicism movement today. And then it's good to welcome back uh, for the second week in a row, Jonathan McClatchy, who joins me on Unbelievable Today. Jonathan, uh, as you heard last week, if you were listening then, uh, has various interests, including intelligent design. But he turns his hand to all sorts of other things, too, uh, including issues around the historical Jesus, the reliability of scripture and such like. Uh, And he runs something called... Uh, the Apologetics Academy as well, uh, which he'll tell us about, I'm sure, in a moment's time. But you can find links to both my guests from today's show page at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. Um, let's talk to uh, Richard Carrier first, who joins us on the line. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for making time for today's show. Um, tell us, just remind us again, um, for those who haven't heard your previous contributions, how you got into the whole rather interesting area of Jesus mythicism studies. Yeah, I uh, I actually was adamantly against Jesus mythicism for quite some time uh, throughout graduate school. Uh, what happened was uh, some people whose opinions I respected said that there's this one author that you should read. There's a lot of terrible authors out there who write terrible mythicism that's you know factually incorrect and fallacious and has ridiculous theories and so on. But uh, they said you should read Earl Doherty, and so I, I read Doherty's book and I realized like, well, okay, he's got a decent theory. It's actually a defensible theory. What is the response to it from the historicist community? And there really isn't one or hasn't been one. Uh, and that, that left me to be like uncertain then, like maybe an agnostic, like 50-50. And then eventually uh, when the economy collapsed, uh, my fan base developed a postdoc research grant for me to do a research project on this. So I developed several books, um, got uh, the major one through peer review, uh, arguing that one in three chance that Jesus did or Jesus existed, which is you know, not a certainty that he didn't exist, but it, I think on balance, the probability is that he started as a revelatory being and was transported into history uh, a lifetime later. Okay, I'm going to pause it there, Cam. Make sure you're unmuted. Uh, welcome, everybody. If you're joining this live stream, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear Cam? Cam, say something. <laughs> Testing. Hello. Did you just sneeze? I did, yeah. B. Joe, you can hear us both. One point that uh, Carrier made at the very beginning is um, when he calls himself a mythicist, he gives it a um, uh, thanks, Beach. He gives it a thirty-three percent chance that uh, Jesus existed as a fleshy human form. So he's not saying that no. Uh, uh, Jesus did not exist. He's saying, I give it two thirds chance that he did and one third chance that he did. And I'm just the opposite. I'm probably two thirds convinced that, um, Jesus existed and one third that he didn't. Where, where are you at Cam? I think I'm more like 50, 50. Okay. So, uh, our goal here to just, uh, I, th I think the, the evidence for both cases is insufficient. So our goal here is just to critique, uh, listen, recap to what uh, Jonathan McClatchy and Richard Carrier have to say. We will ask you at the outset, once we start the discussion today, to, to lay out that thesis in, in a little more detail, obviously. But I, I think it's worth acknowledging, I think as you acknowledge, that the, the view you hold, the mythis, mythicist view, is a minority view. Um, and, oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and in that sense, um, you're, you're, as it were, presenting the case against what many people believe is is the obvious fact whether they believe he was the messiah or rose again or anything like that that someone called jesus and Nazareth did exist and did things that to some extent were recorded 
um, uh, for posterity. Uh, and so, I mean, do you often find people are simply um, dismiss you out of hand because of the, the views you hold? Uh, I know that you have had some pretty big run ins with uh, various <laughs> New Testament historians over the years, even the non-believing ones, as it were, you know, people like Bart Ehrman and so on. Uh, I mean, is it a difficult position to, to be in uh, the one you, you hold? Yeah, certainly. Uh, what surprises me is how adamantly everyone refuses to read the peer-reviewed book that I published on this. It's like, well, at least read the peer-reviewed literature, like have an informed opinion on it. Uh, and, and that happens a lot. I'm really surprised uh, by just their adamant refusal to do that. They just dismiss it out of hand, literally, uh, without actually, let's, let's look at this. Let's actually debate the possibilities. Um, let's consider this. Let's add this to the list of theories, because there's a whole stream of contradictory different views of the historical Jesus and on the origins of Christianity, this is just one of many. Uh, and I think it deserves a place to be debated among most all the others. Well, it's time to introduce our other guest on the program today. Jonathan McClatchy returns. Um, Jonathan, um, this isn't your prime area of specialization. We kind of did that last week in a way. But um, what, what's led you to, to get so involved nonetheless as a layperson in engaging with these issues around the the, the reliability of scripture, the existence of Jesus, and, and, and other such arguments. Well, I'm very passionate and enthusiastic about having a well-informed, intelligent, evidence-based, and rational Christian faith. So as a Christian, I believe that I'm a Christian because Christianity is true. And so I'm very interested in examining the evidence very carefully to uh, look at uh, the reasons why um, I'm a Christian and also some of the best objections to the Christian worldview. So I'm actually very grateful for people like Dr. Richard Carrier to present some of the, the most rigorous uh, arguments against the Christian faith so that we can see exactly where the balance of evidence lies. Of course, in a way, Jesus' mythicism... Uh... So with that, um, it somewhat sets up this point of view that the purpose of um, the myth, mythicism thesis is to provide an argument against Christianity. Um, I don't know if he was meaning to imply that, but but I, I don't think that that's what, like, why these arguments should be discussed. It's not anti-Christian or like wait, I mean, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying, Cam, that uh, historians who may be interested in whether on the question of the historical Jesus aren't just trying to lead people to hell? Are you saying that's not <laughs> what they're doing? <laughs> um, maybe some of them are. I mean, I th I think maybe some uh, some have been in the past, but uh, I don't think that the debate among about mythicism is really a debate between um, fundamentalist Christians who believe Jesus was the, you know, miracle working figure portrayed in the gospels and secular historians um, who think he maybe didn't exist. It's more a debate between secular historians who think that he existed, but was a very legendary um, figure and, Okay. Secular historians who think that he didn't exist at all. I th I'm going to make a prediction here that cannot be falsified, but it's in the record if my YouTube channel stays up for the next 200, 200 years. <laughs> if I bequeath it. I predict on March 7, 2018, that um, 100 years from now, that the majority of historians, New Testament historians, will say Jesus did not exist historically. That's my prediction. I mean, probably didn't <laughs> exist historically. And there might ba the basis for this prediction is, because that's what happened to Moses, and that's what happened to Abraham. Everybody, all the historians said, oh, no, no, Moses existed, uh, Abraham existed. And what was it, in the 70s that changed or something like that? And now the majority yes, say that they... In the 80s, 90s. Yeah, and now the majority say that uh, those two probably didn't exist. So that's my prediction, that this, Jesus will go the same way. Sorry, Jesus. Is, is increasingly well known because of the phenomenon of the internet, which, mm -hmm. which obviously allows um, these kinds of positions to be broadcast widely. Uh, and there are kind of communities that sort of gather around that, in a sense. And in a sense, you're doing the same from the apologetics side. You're, you've got a, the Apologetics Academy, which is a, a regular sort of um, 
I guess it's not Skype that you use, but you, you, there's a sort of way in which you, you gather lots of people in one place online to hear from some of the, the, the finest both um, people against Christianity and for Christianity, people like Richard and others who, uh, who you invite on to hear their arguments and then discuss it in this sort of webinar style. Mm, absolutely. I mean, my paradigm has always been that if Christianity is actually true, we have nothing to fear from hearing the very best and well-informed critiques of the Christian worldview. So I've had people like Bob Price, who's another mythicist, on the webinar a couple of times. I've also had David Fitzgerald on, who's a friend of Richard Carrier's. Um, and I've had uh, various prominent philosophers and scholars, including Dr. Stephen Law and others as well. By the way, I respect Jonathan greatly for those for doing that. Uh, rather yeah, me like too, this show, I think which had... It's, it's really admirable that he has folks like that on. But once again, he's kind of propping up this narrative that, um, that demonstrating that the historical Jesus existed somehow supports Christianity. Like, it's... Um, I mean, there are figures who believe in the truth of Christianity and don't think that Jesus existed as a historical figure, yeah, but like those... Thomas Bro- Brody, for example. Yeah, but those but, are not true Christians, Cam. Come on. Sure, but m- my point is, is that like it sets up this idea that like demonstrating Jesus existed somehow like confirms Christianity, but. That's a false yep. narrative. I mean, most New Testament historians think that Jesus was largely a, um, you know, that he did exist, but he was largely a, um, you know, a, like legendary figure. Like the antithesis of Satan. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, right? Think Satan, make him good. You got Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's blasphemous. I apologize. This... That's very much the same sort of uh, approach that um, we shouldn't be afraid of engaging, you know, some of the strongest objections to Christianity and, mm-hmm. and, and meeting them them head on. Um, uh, so so if, we, if, if people want to do that, and it is kind of, as you say, it's kind of like taking apologetics to the next level. It's, it's a very in-depth kind of treatment that you give it. Or in the Apologetics Academy. If people want to find out more about when, when all, all the Christians are just stop listening up after what I said, on, where should they go? Right, you can go to www.apologetics-academy.org and click on online apologetics training. That'll take you to the upcoming schedule. Uh, we use a, a webinar platform called Zoom, uh, so we live stream on Facebook, and uh, we are we are able. I'm going to fast forward the advertising and, and stuff like that. It is amazing that. what you can do now. Um, it's so easy. Sorry, Christian Radio Premier. Top quality people in these feeds more serious version of mythicism that can be argued. And, and that was really uh, first hit upon by Earl Doherty, and then I've developed it into the first peer-reviewed defense of this position. And one does have to distinguish between those two things. There, there is a lot of, like you said, the, the crazy internet version of mythicism. Uh, but then there's also the serious academic version, uh, which strips away all of the stuff that, that's implausible or uh, excessive, speculative, and so on. Well, I'm really looking forward to what we're going to be doing today. We're, we're going to be diving fairly deep. <laughs> it's a little bit of a warning for the audience as much as anything uh, that we're going to be going into some depth in terms of the, the scriptural analysis, uh, the historical analysis, uh, specifically focusing, though, on the Apostle Paul and whether he actually believed in a, in a real flesh and blood Jesus or a celestial Jesus, the kind of Jesus that to Richard Carrier says that uh, was actually the foundation for the Christian story. Uh, so we'd be interested in hearing your response. By the way, Christians listening, uh, if you want to defend Jesus, don't use the Gospels, use Paul. That's your best bet. This is to anything you hear on the show today. Unbelievable at premier.org.uk is, of course, the email address to send those into. Uh, you can also find us online via the social media and leave us your thoughts that way. At UnbelievableJB on Twitter. Facebook.com slash UnbelievableJB if you'd like to get into Like Christianity, we have friends and then he's... To it and, uh, ...ons unbelievable jb if you'd like to get in touch via facebook follow us that way all of those links and more links to my guests and today's program uh the ways to share it on listen to the podcast all at the show page premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable yeah uh sorry about th- it's not precise rewinding and fast forwarding on the on their website so i'm doing the best i can so uh, did uh, the Apostle Paul believe in a real or a celestial Jesus? That's what we're asking today, because um, uh, one of the foremost m- Jesus mythicists in the world joined us on the program today. Uh, that is Richard Carrier. And he's um, got what, what when he first told me about this thesis, when you came on, I think it was with Mark Goodacre several years ago, Richard, when you happened to be in the country at the time. I must confess, I myself did and I guess continue to feel 
I'm persuaded. I felt this sounds so far fetched. It sounds unbelievable to coin a phrase um this idea that uh, jesus never existed and all of the writings we have from the apostle paul from the gospels well they're either much later sort of fabrications or they are references to a, a purely spiritual celestial phenomenon or what they believed was a spiritual fl- celestial phenomenon not to a flesh and blood Jesus. So I'm going to have to ask you to, to lay this out in a little bit of detail now so that uh, we can hear what Jonathan has to say to it and uh, and see what others think of it. Um, so so go ahead. This is your chance to uh, to lay down your thesis. I mean, at first we have to correct that the, the myths, the, the valid, the defensible uh, mythicist thesis does hold that Paul believed that Jesus became flesh and blood, that he acquired, in fact, literally Jewish flesh, uh, that he actually acquired a, a mortal body and died in that mortal body. But the the view of this particular version of the origins of Christianity holds that that actually took place in a mythic realm, not not actually on earth, not in Jerusalem, etc. And and in that sense it tracks very similarly another savior cult in a neighboring province which is Osiris cult. Uh, and we have from Plutarch where he actually says that in the Osiris cult they had tales where Osiris is an actual historical person and his death and resurrection take place on Earth. But he says that those are allegories you, for the real story. Where the, what actually happened is that, is that uh, Osiris uh, acquires flesh in the lower heavens and then he's, he's killed there and then resurrects. And then this gets, in, in that version of the, of the religion, it gets cycled year by year. Um, but the point being is that there's this celestial version of acquiring flesh and dying and then there's the earthly version, and the earthly version is not true. It's it's just an allegory for the cosmic things. Uh, and- I just want to highlight, uh, and Cam, I don't want to talk too much about this, but if you read Genesis, if you read the New Testament, uh, it seems to me a lot of people back then uh, in ancient times believed that if you were to go up and go up, 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 you'll hit like a third heaven or something like that. A real place. It has a direction. You can point to it. That's why Jesus ascended. And um, and so what Carrier is talking about here is that this Jesus person was real, existed, but in that uh, realm of uh, existence, not the one that's down here on earth. Is that correct, Cam? Yeah. And I mean, it's not as if... Uh during the first century all jews believed the exact same thing but yeah the cosmology of the time was one of um different like layered heavens and some jews believed that there were like gateways or doors between these different layers of heaven and that there were actually uh, beings like angels and demons in those realms um, and it, it sounds like a really crazy belief to people today because they can't imagine people believing that there were actually like physical objects in space and that there were actual beings that were physical. Um, but that is what was believed by a lot of people at that time. It's still it's, just, it's still believed by a lot of people today, and they're called flat earthers, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them. And so uh, we're, they don't just pull this stuff out of thin air they're they're actually more biblical than other christians <laughs> well yeah that, i mean that's obviously strongly disputed by by christians today but i mean my position or my perspective is that with the um you know discovery of modern cosmology um a lot of the conceptions of the original cosmology of these peoples get abstracted away into some kind of um you know ethereal realm or different dimension or something like that and we have a lot of that uh, stuff (laughs) going on with uh, ancient savior cults in general So when we're looking at a savior cult like Christianity, we have a lot of similar characteristics, uh, baptismal initiation, you have mysteries, you have fictive kinship where everybody's calling each other brother and sister, Uh, you have uh, the equivalent of communion where you have communal meals, and you have this idea of a personal savior. And the personal savior God always undergoes some sort of passion. Literally, it's the same word in Greek. Uh, Sometimes it's a death and resurrection. Sometimes it's something else. And Jesus looks like basically a Jewish version of this. Everything that's different uh, between Christianity and these other savior cults can be explained by looking at the Jewish side of it. That They've imported a lot of Jewish ideas and changed things up to make them more Jewish in their characteristic. So when you look at this, we know all these other savior gods didn't exist, uh, and yet all of them had tales about them placing them in history in some form. So on earth history, I mean. 
in some form. So we have we, what we need is more evidence that Jesus is different from all these other sacred gods, that he uh, uniquely amongst them all actually was an actual historical person on earth. And so where would you go to look for that evidence? And you would go, let's let's with the earliest documents you can find. And, and decades before the Gospels get written, placing Jesus in earth history, uh, you have the letters of Paul. And, and, you know, mainstream scholars agree there's only seven of those letters that are authentic. So we're narrowed down to like these seven authentic letters of Paul. They're written in the 50s AD, so about, thir- you know, 20 years after. This is a problem for a, a lot of Christians, um, the conservative ones, because they don't, they don't agree. They don't buy this. The Bible's inspired. It's the word of God because of prophecies and other reasons. And so, no, to say half of Paul's writings, uh, what, a quarter of the New Testament or a third of the New Testament's forgeries? Like, that's terrible to say that. But that's the but, consensus of scholars. Yeah, and, and that's why, in my perspective, this debate is not a, de- a debate between fundamentalist Christians and, you know, atheists or something like that, because th- there's just a, a gulf between the perspectives. And in particular, um, the, the there's a gulf between the fundamentalist Christian perspective on the Bible and what is the consensus position of New Testament historians. The event would have occurred if it were a historical earthly event uh, when the religion began. So uh, when we look at those now, when we look at the authentic letters of Paul, he repeatedly says the teachings of Jesus came by revelation after his death. I mean, he never mentions anyone ever having met Jesus or even seeing Jesus before his death. Paul never mentions Jesus selecting disciples or having a ministry or performing miracles or exorcisms or ever being or doing anything on earth. He's very vague about that. So just as Paul believes Satan, for example, was a historical person who fought a war in heaven and was cast down, yet still not becoming a a person on earth, and we don't believe Satan is a real historical person who lived on earth, uh, so also Paul may have believed the sacrificial drama played out by Jesus, which reversed the fall of Satan, it undid the effects of the fall of Satan, was similarly not on earth, right? So we know Paul and the early Jews and Christians of his day believed things like castles and gardens existed in the sky and the heavens and that battles and burials took place there. So when we're reading the letters of Paul by themselves, we can't tell whether he means the crucifixion and burial of Jesus took place in the sky or on earth. He never says. He never says where Jesus was made or born or where he lived or where he died. He always references his death and resurrection as an event of cosmic significance. This is exactly why I did that uh, uh, Christian challenge a while back, Cam, is because I don't think a lot of Christians realize this, what, what Richard Carrier just said. If you take the authentic letters of Paul that the consensus of scholars agree Paul wrote, he doesn't mention Mary, he doesn't mention Joseph, he doesn't mention Pilate, he doesn't mention any specific miracles to other people, he doesn't mention a tomb. Um, what else doesn't he mention? There's a lot of... Ministry. A, a ministry. Choosing disciples working miracles, clearing the temple, predicting the temple's destruction. Um, really, like, I mean, if you if you really, really hold in your mind the hypothesis that the events as described in the Gospels actually happened, and you just, like, hold that as a theory, and then, like, you ask yourself the question, what would you expect to find in the literature, the first literature we have written that has, that talks about Jesus? The idea that you wouldn't expect to see any of the contents of what occurred in Jesus's ministry, it, to me, is absurd. Effectively, the only thing that is discussed is the death and resurrection, which isn't placed on, you know, in any physical location or at any, any particular time, um, you know, in relation to, say, like but, leaders or anything. But, but Cam, uh, don't be silly. Uh Everybody was alive who knew Jesus back then, and he didn't need to go into the minutia of uh, who his parents, earthly parents were, and where he was born, and his ministry and miracles. Everybody just knew that. That was common knowledge. So uh, Paul was just giving uh, the broad outline of who Jesus is in those early letters. The, the problem with that form of reasoning is, um, To me, what it would tell you is that if he did mention those things, then it would be evidence against Jesus's existence. Because like you're saying on the one hand that you don't expect him to mention it. 
But if if you don't expect <laughs> this might be a complex argument, but if you don't expect him to mention it, if he does, then it's kind of evidence against, and that's weird. Um, the yeah, I, I think that like if you really hold in your mind the hypothesis that the gospels are true, it's unexpected. No r random details from his ministry and teaching would be mentioned. I mean, there are some things, but the hypothesis of uh, secular scholars um is actually that the gospel writers are influenced by the pauline letters for example experts on mark claim that the contact between um paul's epistles and mark occurs not because the things within mark actually occurred it's because mark was using paul's letters as a source yeah or I, at least were influenced by there's uh there's going to be a lot of things jonathan will mention that uh he'll argue uh points to a, a physical fleshy jesus uh, and that's coming up and so that's where we look at it looks a lot like osiris cult in that regard so from the letters of paul we just can't really tell which version of Jesus did he believe in? The the modern idea of a historical Jesus who was embellished and legendized after his death, or this uh, you know this parallel to Satan, a sort of anti-Satan, as it were, who, who undergoes a drama in the heavens. And that that's the the competing theory of the origins of Christianity uh, that I'm advancing. It, it's it's a, a very interesting theory, um, and in a sense uh, hinges, I suppose, on a, a few things. So, including that. This was, as you say, a, a Jewish sort of version of these pagan um, sort of celestial savior cults that existed. Um, obviously, you're you're excluding a certain amount of the Pauline corpus by by restricting it to to the seven right. that you believe are are, are authentic, and um, and obviously, um, presumably, presumably uh, putting out there as well that the gospels, which are obviously the, the accounts of Jesus' earthly life, were later fictions, essentially, kind of clothing in flesh and blood this um what was originally really a celestial figure so is is that kind of a, a summary to some extent of of the different elements that need to be in place for for your thesis to carry yes of course uh yeah that's that's it begins there and just that brief summary there's obviously a lot more to <laughs> there, there's a lot more to present <laughs> uh yeah but uh, but yeah that captures the gist of it. yeah um well let's start with general things then jonathan as you respond to this um uh, I, I guess maybe first of all this idea that uh, the the, the Christian movement really was a Jewish version in in the first instance of other uh, celestial cults, the Osiris cult and others, um, but put put in this kind of formulated in this particular way. What's your approach to that when you when mm -hmm. you compare it to other cults yeah, of, the, uh, of the time? Yeah, I, as Carrier mentioned, we have to look at uh, the Epistles of Paul and, and the New Testament material to see whether it does correspond to that sort of model or paradigm that he is uh, advocating for. Um, I just wanted to note for the record that I, I don't uh, subscribe to his uh, minimal Pauline corpus that he wants to uh, uh, pin Paul down to just seven of the 13 letters of his. Let me quote uh, from Richard Carrier um, from his book on the historicity of Jesus. He writes, and I quote, there is a great deal wrong with how a consensus has been reached on the dates and authorship of all these Christian materials, and the conclusions usually cited as established tend to be far more questionable than most scholars let on. I think there is a lot of work here that needs to be properly redone in New Testament studies, and I'm not alone in thinking that. I completely agree yeah. with Dr. Carrier. I Kerrier. agree with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Given you wrote it, that should, shouldn't surprise you, yes, but... <laughs> What I'm hearing Jonathan saying is, okay, uh, these scholars say that uh, half of the Pauline epistles are uh, forgeries, um, but we should doubt their scholarship, Cam. Uh, and I'm going to quote Richard Carrier here in his from his book that you know there's a lot more work to be done and we shouldn't have any hasty judgments. But it seems like when you have a situation where you have scholars disagreeing. I think the default position should be one of, hey, let's just back up a second here and and be agnostic, doubt it, uh, rather than, I think Jonathan's come from the point of view is, no, the default position is that all these are, are, are real letters from Paul, and so we should doubt that uh, they're not. And it's sort of like the, the worldview default position type problem. Well, it's also like completely disingenuous for Jonathan to use that quote as if it's something that supports supports a point he's trying to make. Because the point that Carrier is making there is actually to do with the fact that there are a lot of assumptions that are made in the analysis of the Christian literature that need to be revisited given 
um, the effectively the questionability of those assumptions and that applies both to the calling corpus even the authentic letters but also a lot of the jesus tradition that was previously analyzed using criteria that have now been demonstrated to be ineffective at um, teasing out historical from non-historical material in the jesus tradition so i just want to say jonathan if you are listening to this now or later uh uh, we love you. We uh, we like you. Uh, we're just criticizing uh, this debate. And uh, Carrier, if you're watching this, you're a dirty apostate. Please leave. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Here we go. But but Carrier, what what yes. you're about to comment comment on it, Jonathan? So I I think that uh, the reason I agree with it is probably the opposite reason from why Dr. Carrier agrees with it because I think that Paul wrote all thirteen letters of Paul. And I think that uh, a lot of the conclusions that are cited as established in New Testament scholarship, such as the authorship of the 13 letters of Paul, are based on, on rather shaky foundation. And f in fact, I find the case for the Pauline authorship of the 13 letters of Paul more persuasive than the case against that. Um, but that being said, let's look at uh, the information that we can extract. Yeah, it like, <laughs> just like, Sorry. I, my, my comment about that is, Jonathan, I hear what you're saying, <laughs> but why is it that it's more persuasive for you that they're all authentic, all 13 of Paul's letters? And why is it more persuasive to guys like me and Ken that it isn't? Like, let's really dig it down into what causes someone to be persuaded. And I can't help but think that if you're coming from the point of view that Jesus saved me from my sins— that's a pretty strong motivation that, hmm, I want this to be true, that it's more theologically grounded. Now, you could argue the same thing for Cam and I. We just, we just so desperately want this to be false. But that's not the case. That's not true for me. <laughs> yeah, it's not true for me either. Like, I got so much to gain if I could force myself to believe this. Uh, and I have family who would love the fact. I mean, the just the pastoral epistles alone like being able to argument that though uh, sorry argue that those are authentic that's an enormous challenge to meet and um just to yeah anyway anybody who's interested in it should go and read the works of pauline scholars who actually analyze um these materials in relation to one another to determine whether or not they originated with a singular author and the conclusion of those scholars is that they didn't and it's not based on just like flippant reasoning it's based on very sound reasoning of analyzing the theology the style the word usage the um when those words were prominent within uh, the Greek period and all sorts of um, criteria that he used. It's about yeah, the life of Jesus just... from the Pauline epistles. Um, and I know Dr. Kira has written a lot on each of these, so um, we'll probably not get through all of them. But um, he, Paul says that he's born of the seed of, um, of David in Romans 1.3, that he's born of a woman born under the law in Galatians 4.4, 4, that he stood before Pontius Pilate in 1 Timothy 2.13, and I take 1 Timothy to be written by Paul, uh, teachings about divorce in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10. He is betrayed in 1 Corinthians 11.23. We have the Last Supper in 1 Corinthians 11 um, also. He, um, he had brothers according to Galatians 1.19 and 1 Corinthians 9.5. He had 12 special followers um, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 5. He was crucified by the rulers of this age in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, and he was killed by the Jews in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 16, 13 through 16. So maybe we could uh, take one of these at a time and kind of interact um, on those texts. I mean, we... Yeah, take them one at a time. You just listed, what, 10? We could yeah. start perhaps with um, the rulers of this age um, that we read of in 1 Corinthians 2 that, um, that are said to have crucified the Lord of glory. Let me just read the text and let Dr. Carrier spell out his position on it, and then we can interact from there. Uh, we read, and I quote, this is 1 Corinthians 2, But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, Dr. Carrier, take it away. 
Yes, uh, archons of this aeon is the actual Greek under that, um, which is a, a phraseology that's really weird, that Paul does not, uh, does not refer to human rulers anywhere as archons of this aeon. He refers to them as archons. Archons is a generic word for, for rulers, but archons was also a term at the time for demonic powers. Um, mm -hmm. And even you know the Christian scholar Origen agreed that the archons of this aeon, Paul was referencing demons in this passage. Um, so uh, that's that's the thing is it's vague. So what does he mean? Does he mean Romans? Does he mean Jews? Does he mean uh, Satan and his demons? And we have a Christian text from around the same time as the canonical Gospels called the Ascension of Isaiah, uh, which actually in its earliest redaction that we can reconstruct appears to have Satan and his demonic followers in the sky doing the crucifying of Jesus. So uh, so it's vague. So when we look at Paul, we don't know what he's referring to. Does he mean by ar archons of this aeon? You know the the demonic forces of the world or historical forces of some kind. Does he mean Jews? Does he mean Romans? And one thing that's weird about that passage is it says that if they'd known killing Jesus would save everyone, they wouldn't. They would have stopped the crucifixion. In other words, they would have wanted to thwart God's plan to to save everyone's life and give everyone eternal life, which is a plan that makes no sense for the Jews or the Romans. Um, and it does make sense for Satan and his demons who want to keep death in the world. So it's, it's this cosmic drama that Paul seems to be referring to, not a historical event. And we also have Romans 13 where Paul says that the people who are in power uh, are always there doing God's will, that they're in place by you know God's will and do God's will, and therefore you should obey the authorities. Paul never has an apologetic in that section in Romans 13 to explain it. Well, except for the, the rulers who killed Jesus, obviously they were trying to thwart God's plan. Uh, and so God had to hide the truth, the cosmic truth of the death so that they wouldn't and so on. It, there's an incongruity here in, in Paul's theology. Uh, it doesn't make sense. It's almost as if Paul doesn't know that when he says the archons of the Seon crucified Jesus, that he was basically impugning the Roman and Jewish authorities that in Romans 13 he's actually trying to support. Just, mm -hmm. just before... I just want to say all Paul had to do there to put to just put all this to rest is say the name Pilate, but he did not. Yeah, and I mean he could have also said um, the like rulers of the Roman Empire or like of Rome or like it could have been even something that anchored it to some kind of um, historical earthly, um, yeah, but. Before we come to Jonathan responding to that, uh, I mean, it, in some sense, it's strange to me at all that Paul would put a crucifixion in a sort of celestial in the sky is what you're saying that, that, that he had in mind, some some sort of other sphere, because crucifixion obviously was a very earthly form of execution. So uh, what? Well, as what, Hebrews what, says, what, right, yeah. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 9, I think, uh, says that everything that on earth has copies in heaven. There are, there are versions in heaven. And we have this in the Ascension of Isaiah as well, that for, for every for every level of heaven, including the, the lower, uh, the firm, uh, upper firmament where Satan and his demons reigned, there were versions of everything. So there, there's versions of gardens and castles and, and graveyards and things in every different level of heaven. Uh, this is a standard uh, Jewish cosmological view at the time. So uh, when you're talking about a crucifixion, of course they're going to use the uh, the version of crucifixion that, that is a, a copy of what's going on on earth, right? That's So if Satan is going to kill Jesus, that's going to be a crucifixion. That's, that's the way they're going to mock uh, this person. Okay. Uh, so, Cam, is Carrier saying here that at that time, a lot of people believed that there were castles up in the sky, literal castles, literal graves? You're muted. Um, so, I don't think that this view was held by all Jews, and I also don't think that uh, they believed that there was a copy of everything in heaven, but they did believe that there was like a... Uh, Jerusalem in heaven, um, or at least a lot of them, um, and uh, and a temple in heaven as well, or uh, like some form of tabernacle. Um, but yeah, and there was, uh, you know, things that went on, like events that occurred. Um, there were uh, beings that lived there, and yeah so the but also i think there's a, an important um point to make is that uh crucifixion as conceptualized within the pauline corpus um never has anything that associates it 
identifiably with the Roman form of crucifixion, which existed in the first century. Um, and why that's important is because the Greek word, um, the Greek words uh, used for like a cross, like staros and, and crucifixion, don't actually tell you whether or not it was a Roman form of crucifixion and actually could mean in various sources any form of like hanging up um, even hanging up after death. So it was actually like common for people to be stoned to death, for example, and then be hung up on a tree, and that would be called crucifixion. Um, so the, a lot of people c import the uh, Roman conception of crucifixion into the text um, because they're relying on the depiction that occurs in the Gospels. And destroy him. So, so it makes sense in context of the way people at that time understood the cosmology of the world. It, it still sounds obviously very strange, um, you know, to, to, us, our, to yeah. our ears, the, uh, the idea we, we didn't live of Jesus sort view. of being crucified yeah. in outer space or something. But the but OK, wh wh where, where do you want to pick up your criticisms on this, Jonathan? Sure. Uh, so let's uh, deal with uh, this text that we were dealing with in First Corinthians 2. Um, as uh, Dr. Carrier notes, uh, the word archon, uh, he um, argues, uh, could refer to human authorities and rulers, or it could refer to demonic or spiritual forces. In uh, Romans 13, which he mentioned, uh, it's clearly, I think, uh, talking about uh, human rulers and authorities. Um, it says in uh, Romans 13, and I quote, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment for rulers are not terror, it's a, or conte is the plural of archon there again, are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad and so there, in that context, that word is, is talking about human authorities. Now, um, and uh, so, so the question that we want to address is, is it talking about human authorities in 1 Corinthians 2, or is it talking about spiritual or demonic forces? So let's, let's take a look at the uh, surrounding uh, context in um, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. In, chapter, um, in, in the previous chapter, in chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Uh, he refers to human wisdom, human strength, a human perspective, and things that are foolish, weak, insignificant, despised in the world. And he says that his speech was, quote, not based on the wisdom of men, and it was not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. And it's in this context that we get to verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 2. None of the rulers or, um, or contes of this age, eon, understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then verse 9, the next verse says, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God um, um, has prepared for those who love him. And in verse 11, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And in case we still weren't convinced, uh, here are verses 12 through 16. We read, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, and we impart this in words taught, and not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who, that who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so this, to me, uh, um, seems to be inescapable that the rulers being spoken of here are indeed human rulers and not demonic or spiritual forces. Um, so um, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not at all persuaded um, by this um, interpretation. Also, um, regarding the word eon of this age um, in 1 Corinthians 2.8, um, can that word be used in a plain and temporal sense? Well, absolutely, because Paul uses the same word in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Again, using the Greek word eon at that point. And also in the next chapter in 1 Corinthians 3, 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age or eon, let him become a fool that he may become wise. So we're going to go to a quick break, and I'll let Richard, you come back on this. But um, we, we, if you're just joining us on the program today, we're, we're quoting a lot of scripture, and that's because we're trying to get to the bottom of whether Richard Carrier's thesis that, that Paul believed Jesus was actually a celestial being who experienced a sort of otherworldly celestial crucifixion and resurrection and everything else, um, where, where, whether that was really what he believed. He didn't actually believe in a flesh and blood historical Jesus. And uh, and we've got Jonathan McClatchy here in the studio putting the opposite case, saying 
just just starting really with this this section in first corinthians 2 saying it, as far as you can see that it's inescapable that the crucifixion jesus is referring to by the rulers of this age are not some demonic realm it's it's he's talking about the authorities in palestine in that era you know uh, and so on so we'll hear what richard carrier has to say in response and we'll, we'll widen this out to the book of acts as well uh, i think there's a really interesting discussion to be had as well on that in the next section of today's program you're listening to unbelievable I'm glad Justin gave that little recap so cuz a lot of people have come late to this live stream. So this is what we're talking about what Justin just said. There's a commercial right now. I'm going to try to fast forward it. And maybe we'll let uh Richard respond Cam um and then you can give your thoughts on every all the scriptures that Jonathan just it's dedicated to uh listed. Radio. Welcome back to today's oh, program. I did it. Uh, today on the show, we're talking about the mythicist view of Jesus. Now, this has been a, a growing movement online, especially, uh, and perhaps one of the most significant people in the movement is Richard Carrier. Uh, and he says, OK, there's lots of crazy sort of very ill thought through non-academic versions of Jesus mythicism. People who say, I don't know, that it, it was just something invented by the Roman authorities to quell the Jews, the, 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 the Christ thing. Richard says, fair enough, let's put those to one side. But here's a credible theory. Um, the, the very earliest witness we have to Jesus Christ in the letters of Paul, actually, as far as uh, Richard is concerned, never believed in a historical flesh and blood Jesus. That was not the basis of his belief. It was a sort of celestial saviour cult was what Paul was promoting and what he had received, really, from the other initiators of the, the Christian movement. And that only later in the Gospels and elsewhere it was sort of flesh and blood put onto this Jesus character. So um, he's summer, uh, one of my guests on Unbelievable today. And uh, in the, the sort of going, supporting, if you like, the mainstream view is, um, is uh, Jonathan McClatchy, which is kind of ironic, actually, Jonathan, because on last week's show you were, you were representing the minority view of intelligent design against the, the, the evolutionary view. Today, you're the, the, the boots... <laughs> Well, I mean, at the moment, Jonathan hasn't really presented the mainstream view from what I can tell. On the other <laughs> foot, as it were, and uh, Richard Carrier is presenting the minority view, you're, you're presenting the majority view. Um, That's a good point, Cam. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, someone should really go door to door to every historian who has a PhD in this stuff and actually poll them. Uh, that would be a great... <laughs> piece of paper to have and say well you know what 60 percent of people agree with carrier here here and here uh and you know 40 percent or 50 60 percent agree with jonathan mcclatchy's stage like do we really don't know what the majority believe until we actually have all these specific questions and specific answers and my guess is though that many historians are are humble enough to say we don't know well, i'm agnostic but i lean maybe this way or that way but where do you want to go, though, next, um, Richard? Uh, I don't want to spend too long debating this particular passage, but I'm sure you'll want to respond oh, yeah. to, to, to uh, what Jonathan well, had well, to yeah, say. Well, yeah, we'll want to move on to Acts eventually. Yeah, I think in, in everything that McClatchy said, it's 50-50, right? So archons of this aeon, just the vocabulary, if you're just going to decide on the vocabulary, you can't tell. It can mean both. It can mean either uh, earthly rulers or it can mean uh, celestial demonic forces. Uh, and I think uh, it, you either stop there, it's either 50-50, it's indeterminate, we can't tell from that passage, or you can go further and, and point out the thing that I showed that was this contradiction between what Paul is saying regarding the motives and, and knowledge, that's the weird cosmic spiritual knowledge of these archons of the Aeon, uh, with Romans 13, with which what, Roman, uh, what Paul says about uh, the rulers that are appointed by God and wouldn't try to thwart God's will. So if you look at things like that, the context really does start to look a lot like... Uh, um, the alternative view. And, and I think, you know, at best it's 50-50, and I think it slightly skews in favor of the mythicist thesis on that. What, what do you make of that particular comeback that, that uh, Paul seems to be at odds with elsewhere, um, where, where he says this was always God's plan that the rules were, were doing, um, uh, and saying, but if they hadn't, you know, and there's no reason the Romans or the Jews would have thwarted God's salvation plan, but obviously the demonic realm would have had every reason to. And if they had known, they would have they wouldn't have cru crucified the Lord of glory and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think I gave the, the context quite well, both before that verse in First Corinthians 2 and after to show that the consistent argument or thread of what Paul's saying concerns humans. Um, uh, and so I think that the archon uh, or the archonta is spoken of there in First Corinthians 2 
are uh, human uh, rulers and authorities. He mentioned uh, Romans 13, uh, where it's, it speaks about uh, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, uh, um, but, but to bad. Um, I think Paul is instructing us to submit ourselves to the governing authorities and rulers here on earth, even if they are bad. I mean, Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it also strikes me that that if even if you are someone who does take the the the, the, the mainstream view that, that Jesus was crucified by the Roman authorities with the support of the Jewish authorities or whatever, that Paul still obviously does believe that there's a spiritual element going on that that at some level the demonic realm is cheering this on is is in favour of this wants this to happen. Um, so it's not as though we're excluding demonic language as well. Um, in in that sense, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Archon uh, can refer to human rulers, or it could refer to demonic forces. But the question is, I mean, the meaning of Greek words is shaved down by the context. And I think the context here in First Corinthians two clearly indicates it's human rulers being spoken of. I'm, I'm aware we're not going to solve this one now, and there's probably <laughs> lots of other uh, intricate passages we could look at. Uh, oh. One that I'll just bring in quickly because it's often the one that's um, I think been put out there by people like Bart Ehrman to you and others, Richard, is um, mm-hmm. just throwaway references. I think, is it, uh, is it Gal- mm-hmm. you, someone else tell me, but when, when, one, yeah. when, when he talks about James, the brother of Jesus, M right. and others say, look, there's no... Before we go on to James, the brother of Jesus, um, regarding this archons and rulers, are they physical rulers here on earth or in heaven? All this, like uh, Richard Carey says, you know, it's 50-50, and he thinks it leans slightly toward the mythicist view. All Paul had to do is say the word, utter the words, write the words, pilot, and this is put to rest. All this is just now, oh, okay, yeah, Jesus existed and was crucified here on earth. Probably. You want to add anything before they move on to James, the brother of John? I mean, of course, somebody would say, oh, you know, Paul didn't realize that he had to include information in his letters that would demonstrate the earthly Jesus because his concern wasn't what historians would be reading 2000 years later. <clears throat> but um, I still think that uh, it's unexpected that he wouldn't mention those details just in an offhand way, even if he wasn't trying to demonstrate to us 2000 years later, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, that Jesus existed. It's, it, it's unexpected to me that he would fail to mention things that are centrally important to the Gospels. And what Justin brought up at the end, I think, is very important because he basically is admitting, hey, Richard Carrier, uh, we actually agree with you, but we just add on this. But this is also referring to earthly rulers as well. We agree that there was demons up in the third heaven or somewhere cheering on the death of Jesus or whatever. Uh, yeah, we we get well, that. But, that that's, but that's the thing, though, is that in the in, in in the view that is being espoused, the demons don't want Jesus to be crucified, and they wouldn't um, crucify Jesus if they knew. And the reason why is because Jesus's death right. and the the function that it plays is actually against their intentions and against these powers' will. That, that's the idea, is that um, they wouldn't be cheering it on. They're not like, yeah, kill Jesus. Like the, 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 That's not because they know that by Jesus dying, that him being a son of God, his sacrifice will um, remove their power. But then why um, did they do it? In the what's third, that? Then what? Well, well, according to the myth- mythicist view, they were fooled into doing it by Jesus taking the uh, adopting um, the the uh, divesting all of his power um, and taking on the appearance and the um, the reality of a man. And so they didn't realize the that heaven. they were yeah they didn't realize that they were killing the Son of God and therefore like you know fucking things up for themselves excuse my french <laughs> I'll, I'll edit that out in post <laughs> motivation here there's no sort of they're not trying to theologize anything it's just a throwaway reference to james the brother of jesus you don't get a brother of jesus without a jesus to, for him to be the sibling of so what's your explanation of those kinds of you know moments in in paul's letters uh, richard yeah, for anyone who wants to go deep dive on this, of course, my book on the historicity of Jesus uh, really has sections on all of this stuff with scholarship cited and all of that. Uh, but to just quickly answer that one, uh, we know for a fact that Paul believed that all baptized Christians were brothers of the Lord. 
Uh, Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. Uh, so when he's talking about brothers of the Lord, does he mean just non-apostolic Christian? Is that just the word for Christian that he uses at the time? Uh, does he mean cultic brother or does he mean biological brother? And once again, it's unclear. Uh, the way he talks about it, uh, he only uses the, the term twice uh, in his letters, that the letters that we have. So uh, we don't really know. It's once again, it's 50-50. It's vague, which is kind of strange. I think it would be more clear if he's going to talk about the family of Jesus. You'd think there'd be more explicit references to biological kin rather than him making the distinction between, oh, yes, there are brothers of the Lord who are cultic brothers and then there are biological brothers. You would think you would need to make that distinction. Do, do, do you, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with this precise Greek and the language used here, but would it have been possible for Paul to make it a lot clearer that he was talking about a biological sibling rather than a more general spiritual brotherhood? Yes, he could say brother and the, brother of the well, brother of the Lord in the flesh, for example, or something like that. Uh, there's a variety of ways he could do it, and he would feel the need to do it if given the fact that we know that he knows and his readers know that brothers of the Lord are also baptized Christians. So uh, he would need to make some sort of distinction and, and say, what, well, I mean, a particular kind of brother of the Lord. And what's your your view on why he singled out James for this title at this particular moment? In, in the Or he could have said um, James, the son of Mary, just like Jesus was the son of Mary, born to Mary. Again, the same argument that with Pilate, all Paul had to do was say the name Mary, and a lot of this can be just put to rest, but he didn't. These particular letters. Well, he had to. I referenced uh, Trudinger, the scholarship of Trudinger in my book, where he points out that the grammar here actually says, I met, uh, uh, the only apostle I met was Peter, and then I met this other guy, James. In other words, the grammar is actually saying that this James is not an apostle, that he's someone else. And in this argument, in the context of the argument, Paul has to basically mention every Christian he met because he's trying to say that he met, he spoke to hardly anyone. He only got all his information about Christianity by revelation, which we can argue may be my uh, dishonest. But nonetheless, that's what he has to insist to the Galatians is that he only got his information by revelation. He was evangelizing for years before he met any of the apostles to get information from them. And he says, you know, even after three years, I went to Jerusalem and I only met this apostle, Peter, and this other guy. James. And so he, he has to name all of the particular Christians he met. Otherwise, his accusers would say, oh, no, no, but, you know, he talked to this other Christian at that time. So he's he's basically just making a distinction between apostolic and non-apostolic Christians and saying he only met two Christians on that visit. And then it was many, many years later before he met. Them and, and so he uses the word brother to distinguish James from uh, being an apostolic Christian. Um, but but as far as you're concerned, that that could easily just be the brother in the in the sort of spirit, yeah, it's, spiritual it's, sense. It's the same sense as saying I met the Pope and this other Christian, James, for example. I mean, you know, this it's that kind of thing. He's, okay. He doesn't want to say I just met some random guy. James. I, I mean, he doesn't want to confuse people into saying that I met the actual biological brother of Peter. Uh, so he has to actually say brother well, of the Lord it, James to it, uh, it, specify what he means. Well, Jonathan, even today, you know, Christians call each other brother and sister in the law. Mm -hmm. That's sort of, you know, common terminology. What, why in this instance do you feel, no, Paul is actually referring to the biological sense of, of brother uh, when he comes, talks to James? I mean, th this is actually uh, something which is debated by Greek scholars as to whether Paul is calling uh, a James in Galatians 1 an apostle or not. I think probably the majority of scholars think he is calling James an apostle, but be that as it may. Um, if Paul, if, if Richard Carrier was only relying on Galatians one, I think he would have a plausible argument here. But uh, and as he, as Richard Carrier points out, we have Romans eight twenty nine, where um, Jesus is described as being the firstborn among many brethren. Uh, however, we also have First Corinthians nine, where uh, uh, Paul mentions that. Um, that Cephas has taken himself a wife, as have the brothers of the Lord. Um, I don't think he's speaking there just about general Christians taking, taking them for themselves wives. And also in, um, in Matthew's Gospel, I think it's in chapter 13 and chapter 26, we have references to Jesus' brothers, one of whom mentioned is James. And then also in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, uh, Jesus' mother is praying alongside the, the brothers, and the, the fact that they're mentioned alongside the mother suggests that they are biological brothers at that point. And I would argue that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, and so it's directly relevant to them. Um, do, you, do you want to come back on that before we start talking about Acts, Richard? 
Well, I think uh, I actually discuss uh, 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, Once again, he's making a distinction between apostolic and non-apostolic Christians. His argument there is that if even non-apostolic Christians are being given this benefit, because they're arguing over whether he deserves to receive uh, free meals and stuff, uh, if even non-apostolic Christians on church business are getting this, then so should he, uh, because he's an apostle of all things. Um, so it, it, that's once again, it's vague. Does he mean uh, just uh, baptized Christians or does he mean biological brothers of Jesus? It's unclear. Uh, and then when you get to the other stuff, when you talk about you know, what's in the Gospels and stuff, if we look at later legends, of, yes, of course, all kinds of later legends arose about the family of Jesus. Um, that doesn't help us understand what Paul thought, because Paul doesn't show any awareness of these Gospel stories. Do you think Paul doesn't show awareness of, of the gospel stories? John? Uh, well, I, I think that it's, it's rather a striking coincidence that Jesus, that Paul mentions a brother of the Lord called James, and then Matthew's gospel mentions a brother of the Lord also called James. Um, and most people interpret well, the... Why, why would that be unusual when they're using, they're actually cribbing from Paul's letters to actually construct a... <laughs> uh, carriers, the, carrier used the word cribbing. Um Jonathan's saying, hey, it, you know, the Gospels mentioned uh, James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, uh, that couldn't have come from Paul. But Carrie's saying, well, of course it came from Paul. Family for Jesus. Because the, the, clearly that's the way they understood it from Paul's letters. And it's also striking, incidentally, the... Well, yeah, that's, that's mm-hmm. the way the, the Gospel legend writers are creating the legend. Yeah, for sure. Well, obviously, your your view is that it's they are a creating a legend. That obviously, they, that they picked the name James. Right. So, so I, I I happen to disagree with you because I think that the uh, gospels actually go back to apostolic testimony, and so this well, is a point right. at which that's we're where going we to differ, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it goes without saying that you have very different views on a whole range of biblical literature, um, as as to 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 when it was produced, by whom, for what purposes, and so on. Um, so obviously, Jonathan believes that the gospel. And so this is just another example of Jonathan not being um, a presenter of the mainstream view because he believes things about the Gospels that, like, nearly no scholars or no critical scholars actually believe. The idea that they go back to apostolic testimony. It's, um, I mean, most views from what I've seen is that they go back to oral tradition and, um, you know, some more, more critical scholars think that they are entirely fictive literary products, but the oral tradition view, um, doesn't get you to apostolic testimony that only gets you to, you know, some kind of view where there was some kind of stories about Jesus floating around communities until, you know, 70 or 50 years later, the gospel writers finally wrote some Cam, of these stories Cam, down. Cam, you're, you're lying right now. I can I can name, like, there's Habermas, there's, I think, uh, Lycona, and and many, many others that will say that, that the gospels were written by eyewitnesses or sourced directly, you know, from them. So what you're just saying, like, you're, are you are you saying that the majority of scholars out there today will say, no, no, these this is not eyewitness testimony from from people who saw Jesus in the Gospels? Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, eyewitness testimony wasn't the thing being claimed, um, but but yeah, um, I think that the problem here is one of like an availability um, idea. Like, yes, you see. Um, debates by these people like Lycona and Habermas and stuff like that. But when you actually go and read the literature on the historical Jesus, there are many, many, many um, New Testament historians who um, share completely different views, but you just don't find those people um, in debates and YouTube videos and and things like this because they're, they're they're not public communicators. They write their papers on the subject and then they publish them in journals. Um, and you don't find out about that unless you actually go and read them. And so, yeah, I think that these are minority positions. Um, most New Testament historians think that the Gospels are anonymous and they think that um, we that we have perhaps some criteria we can use to tease out what of the Jesus material is more likely to be true and what is more likely to be false. But very few of them think that we can actually identify 
a stream of um, oral tradition tracing back all the way to disciples of Jesus. Yeah, uh, a little piece of advice. Uh, like if I'm talking to a guy like Jonathan, even if I accept everything he believes is true, I can get him down to 25% of the Gospels is dir directly written by direct eyewitnesses. And all you have to say is, well, half the Gospels are, are only written by disciples. So that's 50%. And uh, um, and then within those two Gospels of Matthew and John, not everything there is claimed to have been seen by these people, Matthew and John. Like there's many, like when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, and, like the disciples are not there. So you, we could probably cut, you know, another half of the Gospels out there of Matthew. So we're down a quarter. So even if you take Jonathan's position, only a quarter of the Gospels was actually seen by eyewitnesses. Well, and also, like, of course, Matthew and Luke, um, they are dependent on Mark as a source, despite never acknowledging this, which is weird. Um, and Mark is not an eyewitness, of course, because the tradition about Mark is that he was actually some kind of um, some kind of uh, friend or um of Peter, and so the source of Mark is Peter, and so he wasn't an eyewitness, um, you know, of course, but they do try to posit a close connection there because that's what they need to do, but yeah. Brother John, and when I use the word brother, uh, Brother John in the chat, uh, I don't mean that in the biological sense, Cam, but Brother John in the chat <laughs> says that, hey, the the disciples, Matthew and John, were they there for the birth of Jesus? Yet, uh, but yet uh, Matthew wrote about it. Um, of course not. So that's so you can, as a skeptic, you can talk to a Christian and even accept everything they say is true. And they but they would have to admit that the minor, minority of data detail in the Gospels is not witnessed by uh, by eyewitnesses or written by eyewitnesses. But we, we should move on. Those are um, based on eyewitness testimony, for instance, uh, that they were written much earlier, I imagine, than you think they were written, um, uh, Richard, and, 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 and so on. Let's, yeah. But I don't want to get too much into the Gospels. We have done the Gospels um, in other programs, uh, but we rarely, rarely talk about the Book of Acts, which is an interesting one. Just briefly again, if you would, Richard, give us your summary of what you think the Book of Acts is, which, as far as I'm aware, you believe is, is basically a, a fictional account, uh, by and large. Do you, do you want to sort of spell out what, what you think it is, and, and then we'll see what Jonathan has to say? Yeah, Luke, the author of the gospel, um, whoever he actually was, uh, also wrote this sequel, which is the history of the church beginning right after uh, like his gospel ends up for about 30 years. He gives like the early history of the church for one generation. Uh, and uh, he has a mission there. He, has, he wants to basically propagandize the faith. He has a lot of particular agenda items. He wants to portray the Romans as always favorable to the Christians. He wants to portray the Christians as always law-abiding. Uh, he wants to portray the two factions of Christianity, the Torah observant and the uh, Gentile sides of the church, as uh, always getting along uh, and that, that they should get along. And there's a lot of other mission objectives he has in there. Um, and he's doing it in the way that a lot of fictional history got written at the time. He's he's crafting stories to convey moral points, political points, uh, and, and points about the gospel. He's not if he's relying on historical sources at all. It's really difficult to figure out what are the historical facts and what are the embellishments and changes that he's making to it. And and to that extent, do, do you literally believe the whole thing is sort of cooked up from scratch, or is there like was there a early church community that he was at least drawing something from or albeit in your view embellishing it greatly just an example of um of such uh like unifying and harmonizing that the book of acts has as as, as its objective um i read this from robert price that peter and paul are paralleled each raising someone from the dead, healing a paralytic, healing by extraordinary um, magical means, be each besting a sorcerer, and each miraculously escaping prison. Um, and, and this is just like some of the, like just one example of the way that the Book of Acts functions to place um, the controversy between Paul and Peter within the early church into a new um, pseudo historical revisionist history um, narrative. Or, or do you literally think this was him just sitting down and writing a story from, from you know, from his imagination? 
I don't know. Um, I suspect he had sources. I suspect there's some skeleton of truth in the structure here. And I, and I find that I talk about this in chapter nine of on the history of the city of Jesus, where I think there's peculiar things in Acts that suggest he's working from source material that he's layering on and, and adding to and changing it, it, up. It strikes um, me that it's just difficult to determine. Yeah, which is which. I mean, all I can say is if it was purely from his imagination, he's an extraordinary storyteller because there's a great deal of detail in there you know almost too much detail sometimes and you know in, as he elaborates on paul's journeys and where he went and this. you were shaking your head cam well i think it's just a failure to um i mean i do actually think that there were historical sources and acts but i i think that Justin's comment there is a failure to appreciate the human ability to write creative works um, and also a failure to understand um, the type of education that uh, typical people who learnt to write the type of Greek that the author of Acts does, what kind of education that they would have which involved um, effectively creative writing um, and involved learning techniques of well, taking prior stories and using imitation to produce new stories. Cam, you know I haven't read any, I don't read fiction, and so I haven't read any novels, but is there detail in novels? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of detail, and sometimes a novel was woven into the fabric of of historical facts that were known to the author at the time um, and oftentimes a writer of fiction um, historical fiction will actually use source material from the period in question they're writing for sometimes even current events this happened and that happened and the other but um i mean just just coming back to you here jonathan firstly let's hear your response to that why you think acts is a an actual telling of the history of what happened and and who you think Luke was in that respect, but also obviously how it ties back into our main subject here, whether the the historical Jesus really was a a flesh and blood person. Right, great, uh, great uh, way to go. So, I think uh, that there are there's powerful evidence for the substantial veracity of Acts, and indeed that uh, the author of Acts, who I take to be Luke, was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. I know Richard Carrier thinks that the book of Acts is largely historical fiction, that it was written even in the second century, and I, I don't find uh, those positions at all plausible or tractable. Uh, let's take uh, an example of how it relates to the letters of Paul. So uh, William Paley, who's um, one of my great heroes of Christian history, um, in his book uh, Horry Paul and I, lays out, um, what, he lays out an argument that he calls undesigned coincidences, and I know Richard Carrier has written a couple times on this issue. Um, in the book of Acts, we find um, undesigned dovetailings with the Pauline epistles. Let me give an example to illustrate. In 1 Corinthians 4, for example, uh, Paul, ma uh, Paul mentions uh, in verse 17, that's why I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in, the, in every church. So at the time that Paul is writing to the Corinthian Christians, he's already sent Timothy to the Corinthian Christians. In chapter 16, though, we read in verse 10, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you. So here you just see another example of um, Jonathan relying on um, uh, assumptions that are not shared by most historians and aren't established as background facts for which he can just straightforwardly argue from. Um, that is that Timothy was written, First Timothy was written by Paul. But anyway. For he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So although he's already sent Timothy at the time of his writing, he nonetheless expects his letter to arrive in Corinth before Timothy gets there. Now, where's he writing from? We know he's writing from Ephesus because he mentions uh, Aquila and Priscilla sending their greetings from Ephesus. And so if we look at the book of Acts, we should predict that presumably he sent his letter by boat over the Aegean Sea from Ephesus to Corinth and sent Timothy up the indirect overland route to, uh, to uh, Corinth uh, from Ephesus. Now, when we read it in the book of Acts in chapter, 18, in chapter 19, when he's in Ephesus, we read, in verse 21, now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, that's where Corinth is in Greece, and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. And so we have these texts from 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 16 and Acts 19, which 
fit together like a jigsaw and thus corroborate one another and substantiate the veracity of the Book of Acts. Okay, it's worth if you're listening on podcast, just listening back to that, because there's a lot to take in there. But essentially, it's almost like a detective sort of putting together this, this happened here, this happened here. Oh, and this happened here. Yeah, Justin is, is what he's saying right now is my complaint against the undesigned coincidence argument is it is so convoluted like you have to almost write it out like and see the puzzle pieces fit together uh, and you just can't talk about it like I was trying hard to follow Jonathan here uh, and my guess is most people are just even if you're a Christian you're just going to zone out on this stuff and Justin's admitting this right now Right. But it's also just uh, this hypothesis that these things are undesigned, I think, is often um, unable to be uh, substantiated because of the fact that we have good reasons, for example, in the case of the Gospels, that um, later Gospel authors are dependent on prior gospel authors, but then also in the case of Acts, um, it's uh, been argued by many scholars that uh, the author of the book of Acts actually does have access to the Pauline or some of the Pauline literature. And they all corroborate each other right. in ways that couldn't possibly have been planned sort of in, in, in some sense. So, OK, it's an interesting way of, of, of trying to show that the book of Acts is historically valid, because if we're happy that this letter, the first Corinthians, was written by Paul about things that happened when he sent Timothy and so on, then it seems to, to align perfectly with the, the story that Luke tells in Acts of, of when he sent Timothy and, and, and all that kind of thing. What's your take on that way of, of trying to corroborate uh, the book of Acts, Richard? Well, it doesn't it doesn't help us figure out which things Luke has added or changed. Right. So just the fact that he's using the letters of Paul as source material, he may have had some other source material that doesn't help us determine which things are actually coming from authentic sources and which things are embellishments or changes or alterations. Uh, And we know for a fact that Luke is wantonly altering things. He he definitely definitely has the letters of Paul as source material, but he is wantonly contradicting them. And I'll give you examples. Paul himself tells us that he was unknown by face to anyone in Judea until years after his conversion. Acts has him already a famous person living in Judea from the beginning. Paul says he went to Arabia for years immediately after his conversion. Acts completely erases his mission to Arabia and has him immediately go to Damascus and then back to Judea. And then Paul says he was uh, the one sent by Jesus to the Gentiles and that he had to persuade Peter to accept his Torah-free gospel, and it took years to convince him. Acts has Peter instead receive the revelation from Jesus that preaches the Torah-free gospel, and Peter and Paul are on the same page about that before they even meet. Uh, And so there are many other aspects of direct contradiction between what Acts says of Paul and what Paul himself tells us, which really tells us we can't trust Acts, because Acts, whoever's writing it... Uh, Richard, Richard, this is not a contradiction. This is just merely a friction or a uh, problem that can be harmonized away. Cam, did you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, this idea of um, being able to demonstrate contradictions in the sense of, like, A and not A, um, I think is a little bit silly. Um, What a historian is looking at is how if we take one narrative to be true, um, do we find it expected that a different narrative um, tells a different story? And is that story expected on the hypothesis that the other narrative is true. And in the case of um, the interactions between Paul and the author of Acts here, what we find in Acts isn't expected and in fact needs to be harmonized by introducing additional hypotheses, which you know don't have any independent substantiation other than just the assertion of them in order to resolve the difficulty of the text. Um, it's apologetics. It's harmonization. And we're going to hear Jonathan do just that very soon. Is trying to write their own story. They're changing things that they don't like. They're getting rid of things they don't like. Uh, They're altering the chronology. And we have other examples of mistakes that are made. Uh, For example, um, Acts incorrectly asserts that the messianic pretender Theodos appeared before the census of 6 AD, when in fact his events, Theodos and his whole story, took place in the 40s AD, quite famously which would have been directly contemporary with Paul, and thus Luke, if Luke was a companion of Paul. So a companion of Paul could not have made that mistake about Theodos, Uh, whereas we can explain this mistake if he was using source material uh, not related to Christianity, if he was using the antiquities of 
uh, the Jews by Josephus, for example. Well, there's quite a so, few things to... So I, when you look at all that yeah. stuff, that, that <laughs> okay. means that we have a problem. We, we have, we have uh, okay. access clearly really not telling the truth a lot. A little bit more? Say that again. Do you want me to sketch that argument out a little bit more? Yeah, uh, very briefly. So the the idea here is that um, if it were the case that the author of Luke was actually using Josephus as a source, it would be very easy for the author to make the mistake that he does because of the fact that within Josephus, the chronology is presented in the incorrect order, um, not because Josephus is making a mistake in the chronology, but just because that's how the text is written. And so... Um, uh, he, so G Gamaliel's example presents the most egregious anachronism in Acts. Thutis is his first case. Thutis led a, a rebellion in 44 CE, well over a decade after the dramatic date of the speech, while the revolt associated with Judas took place in 6 CE. The most probable explanation of this era is that Luke took the example from Josephus in Antiquities, um, who once referred to these persons in an inverse chronological order. Other explanations involve elaborate hypotheses, unlikely coincidences, and dubious assumptions. This is, moreover, uh, this is, moreover, but one of a number of instances in which Luke's Josephus, uh, use of Josephus is quite probable. If Luke erred in reading his source here, he would not be the only writer who has been guilty of such a mistake. Uh, let me translate that for, um, for the people who live in the South. <laughs> what, what Cam is saying is that when Josephus wrote about some history, he inverted the chronology in the reading of the text, but he, he got it right. But something that happened later, he wrote about first. And what Cam is saying is that the author of Acts um, wasn't smart enough to catch that. And so he made a mistake by saying one happened before the other just because he read it, this, his source material from Josephus. But if he would have been smart enough, he would have realized, oh, okay, this came for that. So it's more expected that, hey, the author of Luke just made a mistake uh, than that uh, he actually knew this stuff. Uh, so it's evidence that he actually did. Uh, what was the word? Uh, crib. Crib? Is that what? Uh, take um, information from Josephus. Yeah, but w once again, it's another example. If it is the case that the author of X did use Josephus as a source, which I think he did, because I think that there are other cases where he does as well. Um, if that were the case, it means that he used it without citing the source. He didn't say he was getting his details from that source. And, you know, as well, if he was, if it is the case that he used the letters of Paul, it's another instance of him using a source without saying it. Um, and, but not only that, we already know for an like an absolute fact that is almost undeniable that the same author of Acts um, also wrote the uh, the Gospel Luke, and the Gospel Luke most likely used the Gospels, um, or almost certainly used the Gospel of Mark, and most likely used the Gospel of Matthew as a source, and didn't tell us. And so it's just like, this person is not a good historian. Yeah, you know, something similar happened in the Gospels, uh, taking... Um data from the Old Testament. And I remember when I was a Christian, this really impacted me. It was um, Zechari the prophecy of Zechariah 9-9 with the two uh, cults, the mother and the cult, or what, uh, you know, when Jesus enters Jerusalem on a cult. One gospel writer says two, that one says one. And to me, it, was, it became obvious, oh, these writers just are interpreting Zechariah 9-9 differently, just like, and one got it wrong, maybe one got it right, maybe they both got it wrong, who knows? But um, and this is, I think, similar to what uh, the author of Acts is doing with Josephus. Uh, I just want to mention that before the um, the commentary I was reading from is uh, Richard Pervo's, the one that appears in the Hermeneia series, Commentary on Acts. By the way, this live stream is for geeks only, um, so uh, we're going <laughs> deep into scriptures and stuff. So if you're not a geek, uh, please leave. No, I'm kidding. You can stick around. But uh, and so even if you find examples of, oh, maybe it's got this part right, uh, that doesn't help us with the other stuff. 
Okay, there was a lot of, uh, I won't try and repeat it all, but but a number of different areas where obviously Richard feels there's, there's a direct contradiction with the letters of Paul. And, and if that's showing anything, it's that whoever wrote down Acts, they were they were kind of rejigging things and re- remoulding things to shoot, suit their own agendas and so on. General response or particular responses to any sure. of those issues? Uh, just, uh, for example, he mentioned uh, Galatians 1 and Paul swearing that he didn't go up to Jerusalem, but uh, but rather he went away to Arabia, and Acts doesn't mention this in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we read um, in verse uh, 23, when many days had passed, the Jews um, uh, plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, etc. And, he goes, to, he, um, and he, he goes to Jerusalem. So um, the key point here is what does it mean for Luke to write many days? And if you look, I think it's in First Kings chapter 2, um, the same term, many days, is taken to refer to a three-year span at that point. So it doesn't necessarily, I mean, I think Luke here in, in Acts chapter 1 is telescoping uh, quite significantly. Um, and also on the point that he made about um, the undesigned coincidence that I mentioned in First Corinthians four sixteen and, and Acts 19, uh, I don't think it helps his case at all to, to propose that, uh, that uh, Luke is using Paul's epistles as source material because these are things which are undesigned it's where you have a natural question that's raised by one source and in fact two different passages put together in first corinthians and then it's resolved in acts in an undesigned way and there's plenty of those that and, and as a cumulative case it becomes i think rather preposterous to insist that they're all just coincidental there are also uh, um, instances of external corroboration in acts for example i i'm working on a video right now cam um with mormonism and they use words like cumulative case as well and sort of like hand and glove fitting of the Book of Mormon with the archaeological evidence. Um, it's a little different than Christianity and what Jonathan's talking about, but there's a lot of parallels. And it's like blatantly when a Christian sees the Mormons do it, I think they'll come to realization, whoa, am I doing the same thing the Mormons do? And I, and I think they're wrong for doing it. Yeah, if, if anybody's interested, each of the things that Jonathan raised there is addressed um, in significant detail in the literature on Acts, and I, I don't think those apologetics work. Um, in Acts chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, um, it says that those is, this is when an, and Paul is before Ananias, the high priest. Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was a high priest. And it turns out that Ananias, of whom this is spoken, was in, in truth not the high priest, but he was sitting in judgment in that assumed capacity. In fact, the case was that he had formerly held the office, but he'd been deposed, and the person who succeeded him had been murdered, and there wasn't yet another occupying the station. And so in the vacancy, he had of his own authority taken upon himself the discharge of that office. Um, and so um, th- and there's there's the fact that he, and, uh, he mentions that during the riot in Ephesus in Acts 19, he reports the city clerk tells the crowd that there are proconsuls in the plural. And uh, the proconsul, of course, is a Roman authority to whom the, a complaint might be taken. And normally there'd only be one proconsul. But just at that particular time, um, we know from this from uh, Tacitus, that uh, there seems to have um, been two proconsuls as a result of the assassination of Salinas, who was a previous proconsul, by poisoning in the fall of 54. Um, by the two imperial stewards at the urging of Nero's mother. So you have uh, these these external corroborations, which then um, support the, the Book of Acts. And these these are things which we have to be we have to be careful not to commit the the Wikipedia fallacy or the Google fallacy and assume that the, all, all the people back then in the ancient world had access to Wikipedia and Google and the sort of resources that we have access to today. Now these are hard things to get right if you're not an eyewitness. So you're saying the fact that various things that would have been very difficult for someone making up, doing a fictional history to have anticipated or, or written in, are explained by these corroborating factors, either in the letters of Paul or in um, other sources, which 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 are the, make sense of things that, that it's very hard to understand why they would be there uh, if for any other... Uh, I, I'm confused, like just because someone says that uh, there was two people, two pre-councils instead of one, that makes what Jonathan's saying, well, then this has to be true? It's the most absurd thing. Like the idea that if 
the writer of X got something right about history that in any way pertains to the reliability of the miraculous claims in the book, like the ascension of Jesus or the healing of peoples and the mass conversion of Jews and the, um, you know, resurrections and things. To me, it's a ridiculous form of apologetic. Yeah, it's like, an episode of Star Wars getting the speed of light correct and therefore Star Wars is true. Yeah, and it's like, oh, you know, the Star Wars people, you know, they could have got it wrong, but they actually got it right. <laughs> the reason. I mean, like, it's okay. just a bit I silly. mean, you're still highly skeptical, I assume, Richard, of this way of corroborating the 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 the, the account of acts. Yeah, we won't have time to go into every detail there. I think there's a lot of dubious stuff that was just said. But uh, the fact of the matter, I mean, if we could just boil it down to Luke is definitely using source material. Uh, that doesn't tell us uh, that just because he's using source material for some of these incidental details to build out his stories, that doesn't tell us that the rest of the stuff is true. And we've got many examples where it's clearly not. Now, let's, let's focus on just one thing that uh, McClatchy just mentioned, which is uh, you said something about uh, the passage where the Jews are trying to kill Paul. It was the first point you made about how somehow the years in Arabia are in Acts. Can you tell me what verse you were relying on? Um, in Acts or Galatians? The book of Acts. In the book of Acts, um, this is in chapter number nine. Oh, sorry, let me find Just it. Just looking it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this is... Well, I thought you read it. Didn't you read... No, verse... no, I, I closed my Bible. It's verse, uh, 20, oh, okay. verse 23. Verse 23. 9, 23, which reads... Do you want to just read oh, it out sorry. for us again? When, when many days had passed, the Jews uh, plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. Uh, they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall ring in the basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, etc. Yeah, that's in Damascus, though. So mm -hmm. where, where, when was he in Arabia? Right, it doesn't say, but it, I think uh, Luke is telescoping here. I don't think he has to throw in every single detail that happens. Telescoping. Well, think, if, he, if he parks Paul in Damascus and then gets to a few verses later him escaping from Damascus, that's kind of obvious where Luke wants us to imagine Paul was. Right, but but <laughs> but but uh, right. he says uh, when he had come to... I mean, to... it's weird to like no. insert a three-year sojourn to Arabia uh, in that period where somehow uh, they're trying to kill him immediately as soon as he converts, and yet somehow he's able to get away do a whole mission in Arabia for three years, come back to Damascus, and then suddenly now he's trapped in Damascus and he has to escape from Damascus? That, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Just, just explain how, how, what you're meaning by, by this, this idea of the many days then. Yeah, so, so I, I don't think Luke necessarily even perhaps knew about the, the uh, trip to Arabia. Um, Paul may or may not have told him, but uh, the, so I, I, I don't think this contradicts the um, book of Galatians. Paul may simply not have known this. He knew that the, uh, the, there, were plot, there were plots made to kill him, and so he leaves uh, Damascus, and then he then he's in Arabia. We know that from verse uh, twenty six when he comes to Jerusalem. So I, I don't think this necessarily there's, contradicts the Galatians. There's no at all. reference to Arabia there, so I don't. Know no, I, I agree that, with you. But... I don't think there's a reference to Arabia, but I don't think it contradicts Galatians. W w let's move on because just before we um, sort of have to go to a break, tying this back into the question of the historical Jesus for you. Jonathan, the fact that you believe that there's evidence that Paul went on all these journeys, had these interactions with people like Luke, um, presumably that's, that's relevant because then that corroborates the gospel account of Luke. Uh, it, it just, just explain yeah, how, yeah. how, in your view, this all helps to take us back to the historical Jesus, the fact that you do believe that Acts is a historical account of, of Paul's comings and goings. So if uh, the book of Acts is indeed written by a travelling companion of Paul, then it seems to strain credulity that he would have ended up with this very historical Jesus in the speeches and acts, and also indeed in the Gospel of Luke, which I take to be written by the same person. Um, and um, if, if indeed Paul had this idea of a celestial Jesus, um, and indeed I think that uh, Paul himself has access to Luke's Gospel because he quotes it in First Timothy five eighteen, which of course Kiri is going to deny. So, so that, okay, yeah. so I'm putting the pieces together here. So basically, mm -hmm. if Paul was a traveling companion of Luke. Mm -hmm. it's, it seems it, we wouldn't have had all this historical Jesus stuff in Acts. We would have had the celestial Jesus stuff, in a sense, if that's who Luke, exactly. Luke was, was right. traveling with and getting his theology from. Um, but as it is... Now, obviously, 
Richard's point is he just doesn't believe there will, Luke was a travelling companion with Paul. He thinks he was taking his him as sources and, and inventing a story. So that's obviously where where you part company majorly. But but it's helped me to see how how this um, engages with uh, with the whole question of what Paul believed. Um, we're going to go to a quick break, and uh, we'll, I'm sure Richard will have some some more uh, to bring to us, and uh, Jonathan as well, as we continue to discuss the question: Did the Apostle Paul? Okay. So, <laughs> uh, I got a lot of thoughts about this. Uh, Christians realize that this is a problem. I think they really do, because Paul says uh, that he went to Arabia, didn't go back to Jerusalem for, what, three years? Uh, in Paul's letters, he says that. But Luke, it's just not there. And so here we have a problem of uh, Luke is apparently a traveling companion of Paul and fails to mention that Paul went uh, someplace for three years. In fact, in the text in Acts, um, makes it sound, at least makes it sound like, um, yeah, that that never happened. But, yeah, and it's also really implausible on prior probability grounds because it's well established within the field that uh, the Gospel of Mark was written in 70 CE and that the author of the of the gospel luke um used mark as a source but now it's being hypothesized that the same author who wrote acts was a traveling companion of paul like 30 30 years before like it's just not plausible and this is like I, I think that Jonathan said something quite revealing at the beginning of that last section where he he said something that made me think that the real reason why he believes that um, Luke was a traveling companion of Paul is because if it were the case that he was, that it would validate the material in the book of Acts. But, like, remember... The book of Acts never tells us that Luke was the traveling companion of Paul. He, he never says that. Like, like, wouldn't an author who was a traveling companion of Paul say that he was? Wouldn't he say, um, like, I did this and I talked to Paul on this occasion and he told me this. And when Paul escaped from prison, he told me this. Like, it, it doesn't read as if it's by a companion of Paul. And it's never said, he's never said to be. I, I think that it strains credulity to borrow a McClatchy uh, phrase that he was. And I think that it has to go against the consensus view of New Testament historians regarding the authorship of... of well, wait, wait a minute, Cam. Pe people in that in that time and place, uh, in that era, they didn't talk like, I went to there and I went to there, and they just didn't write that way. Well, I mean, some of them did. <laughs> like Paul. <laughs> when, when they were eyewitnesses to things. <laughs> yeah. And when they were narrating things that occurred to them that they witnessed. Um it, you know, you get historians who um, interviewed eyewitnesses that don't narrate details that way because of the fact that they are getting it from somebody else. But then they tell us who they were getting it from. But Luke doesn't do that, or the author of Acts doesn't do that. He doesn't do that in the Gospels. He never tells us that he was using Mark and Matthew as a source. He doesn't know in the book of Acts. He never tells us that he's using Josephus and the letters of Paul. And... Um, and even, I believe, um, some Homeric uh, sources as well, not as sources, but as like inspiration for um, the sea narratives and shipwreck narratives. And, yeah. This is, a, I think this is a huge difference between an apologist and a truth seeker. Ooh, that's going to offend some people. But the difference is a truth seeker not only focuses on what is said in a text, but also what is not said. An apologist just focuses on what is said and then comes up with ways to make things fit <laughs> if what does say seems like is a friction. Yeah, and I think what you find with, um, with apologists is that 
all the way down the line within uh, New Testament scholarship in on every position where if if their view was false it, it would play a big role in um you know doubting the reliability of scripture you find them settling on the side that gives them the best ability to um to, you know to believe it so in, in in the case of the gospels instead of um you know being persuaded by the arguments of historians that say that they were written post 70 after the jewish uh, the destruction of the jerusalem temple what you get is this you know view that places them earlier than the destruction of the temple um you know as actual eyewitnesses to the events it's like well isn't that convenient um they don't tell us that they were eyewitnesses yet um you know this would certainly do something that would help your christian narrative and then in the case of acts you know once again it's like Paul, the the author of the thing needs to be somebody who's placed close enough to the events such that we can rely on it and so who is this person oh look luke <laughs> yeah and well you know this is one very, very simple thing that I like to say to Christians that um, if it's true that the majority of critical scholars say that Acts was written in, what, 85 AD? If that's no, true... No, I mean, I think that most of them think that it was um, written even later than that. But let's, um, let's, let's say 85, just for, for the fun of it. It's highly likely... If Luke was indeed a traveling companion of Paul, Luke's dead. He's dead. He's dead at 85 AD, most likely. He's dead. He couldn't have written it. Now, that is really tough for Christians to swallow, because if it's true that it was written in 85, and they don't believe it is, they believe it's much earlier, that way they can keep him alive. Um, can you imagine how long you guys would have lived if there was no penicillin? You'd be dead by now, most of you. Half of you, I bet, in this listening to this broadcast would be dead if there was no penicillin or antibiotics. And yet, we expect uh, it very probable that a guy named Luke is 85 years old, roughly, up thereabouts, writing this. Well, and remember as well, it, it's not only that they didn't have penicillin and, you know, other antibiotics, but... Jesus never even bothered to reveal to them the germ theory of disease. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't even really know to keep their wounds clean either. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's continue. How it works. Steve Jeffrey will be presenting a more traditional Calvinist view of prayer on that program at the same time next week. And if you can stay tuned to Premier Christian Radio on the profile, youth evangelist and musician C.S. Lewis. And uh, you were going to send me, Fred, uh, the details of a recent radio program on that, which you do in this Commercial. email because you finally got random many of the clergy from the local diocese and also some people on the evening before. So um, it was great to be able to share the details of the show, uh, My Case for God, and the book, of course, there too. If you'd like to get hold of it yourself to, uh, to, to try and tackle just in the last few minutes of today's program. I think you wanted to come back, though, Richard, there we go. Um, with, with something before we get into that. Did you want to go ahead? Yeah, and it does relate to the Gospels issue. Uh, so, you know, McClatchy's position is that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, and therefore Luke Acts, meaning the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, were written by someone who knew Paul. And that's almost, not quite, but almost the same as arguing that Paul wrote Luke and Acts, right? So if you imagine, let's say, for example, that that actually was the case, that Paul had written uh, the Gospel, what we call the Gospel of Luke, and had written the Book of Acts, that would be really strong evidence for historicity. I, I don't think mysticism would have a balance of probability were that the case. So I, I can see the logic of the argument there is sound. I just don't see, th th we just can't establish that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul. He never even outright says he was, for example. Uh, well, so, so that's debatable. Uh, and so that it does come down to when are we going to so just to just to conclude the section on acts i'll read the perspective of one um one of the most prominent um his, uh scholars on acts today richard Pervo, where he says the accusation bluntly put is that luke murdered the history of the early church 
This is a crime because he was a historian and thus obliged to narrate the story with a minimum of prejudice and a maximum of truth. One defense for this misdeed is that Luke was a poor historian. It may also be claimed that he was inadequately informed or misinformed. Accusers vary in their assessments of the gravity of the charges. A goodly number of people consider Luke to be guilty of a few misdemeanors, while some regard his contact conduct as utterly felonous. But what does that guy know? <laughs> a place the Gospels as to when they were written. What can we actually establish versus conjecture regarding who wrote them uh, and what sources they used? Just remaining with Acts for a moment, because this has just occurred to me, and I, I'm no no way as engaged in these these um, texts as you both are. But but one thing that is obvious to anyone reading the Gospels is that, uh, uh, sorry, reading Acts is that at some point there, suddenly the narrator goes from a sort of third person history of what's happening to a first person one. So and this is tends to be this is at some point in the missionary journeys of Paul, isn't it? And suddenly he's starting to talk about we went to patmos and we got shipwrecked and this this happened to to me and and paul um d d does that at any level i'll start with you jonathan sort of confirm for you that this is a that, that luke is the traveling companion because he kind of switches to this first person mode uh, at a particular point when it appears he he was traveling alongside paul in this in this so uh, from Acts 16 hours onwards there's the famous uh, we sayings of the book of acts and i don't uh uh, and th there are there are different interpretations of the we passages. Some see it as um, a literary device for one or another purpose. Um, I think that when you combine it with the external corroborations and the undesigned coincidences, then taken together, it supports Luke as being a traveling companion of Paul. And indeed, Paul himself tells us that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul in the book of Colossians in chapter four. I guess, and um, I'm sure you can shoot this down very easily, Richard, but for my, in my untutored mind, I'm thinking, okay. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, Colossians doesn't say that Luke wrote the book of Acts, so so we can't connect those two. But, uh, and uh, the, the other side of it is that, that even if the author were intending us to meet, to understand that he was with Paul at the time, that doesn't mean the author's telling the truth. Uh, we already know the author doesn't tell the truth a lot. Uh, but the use of first person plural for sea adventures and the we passages are all tie into to, uh, sea travels uh, was a known device in fiction. So that's and you can find this in the mainstream scholarship. I mean, there, there's a lot of discussion of this that the we passages aren't really determinative uh, as to whether the author really was a companion of Paul or even wanted you to understand that he was. Well, look, we'll leave that one to one side. Um, let's talk about the Gospels specifically. Um, maybe start with you, Jonathan. Um, what what for you are some of the things that Richard has to deal with when it comes to the Gospels that for you suggest they can't be, be seen good. as later sort of fabrications or, or made made up stories um it, that, that help to kind of put jesus in a in a place and time and history and so on what what for you are the the fingerprints the clues that help us see the, this genuinely was a place time and history uh, associated with jesus well again i would like to uh, draw on the argument from undesigned coincidences that we find in the gospels so let me give uh, just one or two examples very quickly um in John chapter 6, of course, we have the feeding of the 5,000 miracle, and Jesus turns to Philip in verse 5 to say, where should we send the people to buy bread? And it raises the question immediately in the audience's mind, why does he turn to Philip? Because Philip's a fairly minor character in the Gospels. Why not turn to, you know, Judas Iscariot was in charge of the money bag or someone like that? Why Philip specifically? And we also read about Andrew getting involved in a reply to Jesus. Now, why does Andrew specifically get involved in a reply? These are extraneous details not found in any other gospel. Now, if you go over to John chapter 12, we learn that Philip is from a certain town called Bethsaida. We also learn in John chapter 1 that Philip's, uh, sorry, that Andrew is from Bethsaida. It also mentions Philip being from Bethsaida there as well. Um, in Luke's account of the feeding of the 5,000 miracle, in Luke chapter 9, he mentions that he doesn't mention Jesus turning to Philip, doesn't mention Andrew getting involved in the reply, but does mention that the event of the feeding of the 5,000 took place in Bethsaida, thus corroborating uh, that these were the individuals to whom Jesus spoke in John chapter 6. Uh, just one more example, if I may. Um, in the book of... In the I just want to say I am really impressed with the corroboration that I find um, in episodes 1, 2, and 3 of the Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> Yeah, like, let's just, everybody keep in mind that a good number of historians, and I think, like, the most persuasive case um, has been made by the experts on the 
on the book of, or sorry, the gospel of John, that John actually had access to Luke. So just keep that in mind. And I can yeah. point you to the literature arguing that if you want, um, because, and I find it very compelling. So keep that in mind that John had Luke. So wait, hear, wait, 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 wait. Are you saying, Cam, that we should, when John is talking about undesigned coincidences, we should close our eyes and imagine that author having that other book open in front of them? Yeah, exactly. Because And Luke also had access to um, Matthew and Mark, and Mark had, had access to Mark. So, oh, sorry, uh, Matthew had access to Mark, rather. Um, so, I mean, I think that you need to demonstrate independence before you can use these types of arguments. But then even if you do demonstrate independence, the problem is, is that you're still relying on the assumption that there wasn't common tradition that these authors were all going off. Um, and so in the same way, so in the same way, um, we are to assume that whoever wrote the screenplay for episode two of Star Wars actually read episode one screenplay. Well, so there's two different hypotheses. One, for example, is that um, the writer of the screenplay for episode two um, had actually read the screenplay um, for episode one. But then the other hypothesis is that episode one had become really popular. And so it was in like the common... Um, you know, it was in the common communities that these people were a part of. So say, for example, we imagine like these Star Wars fans who had all seen episode one and they all knew all of these details from episode one. Well, you know, the writer of episode two might have just known that common tradition about episode one. Right. Yeah. And everything that Cam and I are saying right now is not rocket science. It's just common sense. It's, but anyhow, and it's, People who study this for a living all their life say basically like Bart Ehrman and Carrier here. I hate to say this, but they're kind of like laughing hysterically inside when they hear this. Undesigned. They are. Yeah, they find it a joke. And I mean, it's also, um, you know, so bad that McClatchy thinks that this type of method could somehow substantiate this idea that Jesus was miraculously multiplying loaves of bread and fish. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that's the kind of that, that's that's what Jonathan believes. Yes, like, that's an excellent point. They're saying because of these ha this hand and glove fit, we can now believe that Jesus walked on water. Yeah, that's a huge leap. It's such a leap that it's like only done so out of the, you know, the framework of Christian um, faith. Gospel of John in chapter 12, another extraneous detail not found in any other, any other gospel is the time at which Jesus approached Bethany uh, with, the, um, with the disciples. It says, um, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where, La where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And then they prepared dinner for him there in Bethany. And then the following day, he rides into Jerusalem and you've got the triumphal entry scenario. In Mark's account um, of, of the same event where Jesus approaches Bethany, he does not mention this happening uh, six days before Passover. So if we t um, and he doesn't mention that Jesus actually enters Jerusalem on the donkey five days before Passover, the day after. So if we assume then, um, if John is correct, that this actually happened six days before the Passover, and uh, the triumphal entry happened five days before the Passover, we actually have a really neat undesigned coincidence. We find the end of the five days before the Passover in verse eleven. He entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. When he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. That's the end of five days before Passover. Then on the following day, this is now four days before Passover, um, you've got the cursing of the fig tree. And then verse 19, when evening came, they went out of the city. That's the end of four days before the Passover. And then you have, um, you have it uh, in verse uh, 19. Okay, I, I got to stop it here because even, <laughs> even if I'm a Christian and I want to believe this and I do believe this, Jonathan, do you think this is helping? <laughs> Jonathan Stewart. So everybody keep in mind right now that the Gospel of John places, his, places Jesus' death on literally a different day than the Gospel of Mark. And Jonathan thinks that this undesigned, like they couldn't even get their story straight about which day Jesus died on, yet Jonathan thinks that this detail somehow corro corroborates the Gospels. 
<laughs> I feel bad. Uh, we're kind of piling on. <laughs> uh, I there has to be a. I, I actually want to help Jonathan here. Like there has to be a better way to explain this stuff so that people don't zone out. Um. Maybe use a PowerPoint next time, Jonathan, or like with pictures. This is on radio, so it can't, it can't uh, yeah. use that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It just, I, I, I'm just thinking, and maybe there's some Christians listening to this, like you just zone out when you hear this stuff. And, and especially when you come from our perspectives where it's so obvious that John is, is looking at source material from Mark and Luke it's like, well, it all just, and then you add the, what the cam just said, like they can't even agree on what day Jesus died. And then you have to take the, into consideration, well, that huge leap, well, therefore we can reliably say that Jesus rose from the dead or he walked on water. Like all this you combine, it's a cumulative case of doubt. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I have actually read uh, Lydia McGrew's book on undesigned coincidences. Oh, and sorry. yeah, yeah, it is something to feel sorry for me for. <laughs> um, because I wanted to take this undesigned coincidences case seriously, but I found it um, to be very poor, both in terms of logic and in terms of what the evidence is meant to substantiate, even if the logic was correct. Okay, we got about, uh, I think, ten under 10 minutes left. When evening came, they went out um, of the city. Then verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the uh, fig tree withered away to its roots. So now we're three days before Passover. Um, and then in chapter 13, you have the Olivet Discourse, which I think is happening in the evening because the Mount of Olives, where this conversation takes place, is midway between the temple where he's been, at stay, where he's been all day and, and Bethany, where he's staying. Um, so that's the end then of three days before the Passover. And then in chapter 14, in verse 1, it says it was now two days before the Passover. So it calibrates and synchronizes perfectly at that point. So that is um, a pattern in both those cases, which I think is very difficult to explain on a mythicist paradigm. Uh, go, not really. <laughs> go, go ahead. Uh, all, all of the leading experts on John who've written you know, entire treatises on the Gospel of John, they all agree now. Uh, and especially the most prominent ones in the past 20 plus years, that John is using the other Gospels as a source uh, material. He's actually rewriting the Gospel in his own words, but he's using the other Gospels as his uh, material. So he's he's actually, this is a designed coincidence. He's actually trying to clean up some things or make some things make sense or tell a story in a way that, that he thinks makes sense based on his source material. So uh, that... Yeah, th this is a design issue, not a undesigned coincidence a good example, Christians, if you're listening, is just think about John and Luke. Luke talks about a Lazarus that's fictional. Uh, John talks about a Lazarus that's supposed to, supposedly real. One is a resurrection story that doesn't help people believe. The other one is a resurrection story that does help people believe. It's obvious to me, at least, that it's a literary technique that John is using, borrowing off of Luke, ideas from Luke, to tell a different narrative, a different theme, a different moral of the story. That's not an undesigned coincidence. That's a designed coincidence in, insofar as it's a coincidence at all. What makes you, you believe it's an undesigned coincidence? Just that it's unlikely that John would have spotted this particular, or the writer of John would have spotted this particular, you know, the way that these events right. transpired so, and then yeah. and then inserted the very specific thing. Obviously, Richard feels, well, yeah, he's he spotted the same issue that you've spotted right. and, and he yeah. just... Put, 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 you know, said, okay, this is the day it happened. Um, yeah. what, what makes you believe that, that that's not what's going on in this case? So, um, the f case of the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6, uh, John does not mention that the event took place in Bethsaida. He doesn't even give that detail. In fact, he doesn't even mention that Philip or Andrew are from Bethsaida in John chapter 6. He mentions that in John chapter 12 and John chapter 1. Um, and then the other puzzle pieces in Luke chapter 9, where the event took place in Bethsaida. So, you would expect if, if Richard Kyrgios' thesis is correct, that uh, he would have mentioned the event took place in Bethsaida uh, in I don't John see chapter why six. He would need to, right? If he, if he, if if he would, I mean, is he burying these uh, hidden coincidences that weren't discovered until William Paley came along and documented them? 
why 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 would he need to bury them like it's it's not relevant to him right let's see he's getting this uh, these ideas from the source material it doesn't occur to him that he has to mention what city it was in he's basing it on the source material that he has but luke chapter 9 doesn't mention jesus turning to philip or andrew getting involved in the replies and so you've got uh... yeah john is john is like figuring okay so i'm gonna have jesus talk to some people who should i pick to be the people he talks to he looks at his source material he picks some people and he does it uh, that's that's it. That's how it works. And we see we see exactly that kind of reasoning in all kinds of historical writing in the ancient world. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I guess I, I just don't buy that. You have one puzzle piece in, in Luke nine, and you have a hand in glove fit between the synoptics and John at that point. Um, you, I mean, you might be able to explain one or two of of these undesigned coincidences as just a happy coincidence. But They're when not you, coincidences, but when but John when, is aware of the source material, when when you have so <laughs> that's not a coincidence. He's reading the source material. He's basing his own version of stories on the source material. When when you have a cumulative body of evidence from lots of these undesigned coincidences, it becomes... Um, ridic- I, I mean, Richard's making the claim that these are simply not... See, even Justin is realizing... Even Justin is realizing that Jonathan's not answering uh, Richard Carrier's critique right now. And so he he's, he's barging in here. Hey, look... If if it's true that John is has Luke right in front of him or Matthew or whatever right in front of his own eyes and he's picking and choosing what characters to write about, there's nothing undesigned, coincident, coincidental about this. Not undesigned coincidences, I suppose. Is, right. yeah. He's, he's yeah. saying this. This um, yeah. If if John makes sense of two passages, it's because he's read the two passages and he's he's yeah. consciously made sense of them. I mean, I guess what I'm uh, what you need to to answer, Jonathan, is is why why isn't why doesn't this have the flavor of John simply reconciling stuff in his account by looking at, you know, Matthew and Luke and Mark or wherever he's got in front right, of him? Because under that, you would expect him to, to mention that this is taking place in Bethsaida or, um, or to mention that, uh, by the way, Philip's from Bethsaida. Um, but, you, but you've got these, uh, this scattered across different parts of the source material. Uh, and that's something which is more expected, I think, on the hypothesis of history than it is on the hypothesis of fiction. I disagree. I, I don't think it matters to John. I don't think it's important to John that he convey to you what city it was in. Like that, That's not a relevant detail to him. He's, he's getting the idea of what characters to use based on the source material, but it's not going to occur to him that, oh, I better mention uh, so historians 2,000 years from now know what city I'm talking about. That's not how he's crafting his stories. That's not his goal. We're going to take a, a – um, well, we're not – just going to take a break we're going to come to the end of today's program uh, which is a shame because there's, there's lots more we could, we could get <laughs> oh, into yes, and uh, and uh, maybe we could do it another day but uh, it's been really interesting thank you very much both for, for being on the program today uh, if people want to find out more about any thoughts cam yeah well, I, I think that i want to emphasize one really important thing is that right at the beginning of the show Jonathan was pitched as somebody representing the mainstream position with respect to the historical Jesus. And Carrier was pitched as the person arguing against that. But in through the course of the discussion, it actually devolved into a completely different narrative where instead it was the skeptical critical historian arguing against the fundamentalist Christian because the arguments that Jonathan deploys in favor of the historical Jesus are not what the consensus people who believe in the historical Jesus deploy. They hardly rely on the Gospels at all. And when they do, they don't use an argument from undesigned coincidences. They instead use what are called like historicity criteria um, or Jesus criteria to separate material that's more likely to be true or not. And I wonder if they, jo- I wonder if Jonathan would admit what you just said. Like if we, uh, well, if he doesn't, then he's just wrong because (laughs) it's just it's these aren't the arguments that um, this is these are the types of arguments that fundamentalist Christians use. So, are you saying that Jonathan's more in the fringe than a mythicist in how he's arguing here? Yes, definitely. If I had a mic, I'd drop it. Like, even if you go, for example, when you see um, Trent Horn's debate with Richard Carrier, he's a Catholic um, New Testament scholar. He doesn't argue these arguments that Jonathan is putting forth. And if you go and look at, um, for example, uh, Bart Ehrman's debate with Robert Price, he doesn't argue these positions. Or when you look at um, the debate between... uh, 
uh, Zebra Crook and Richard Carrier, Zebra Crook doesn't argue these positions. Or if you look at, for example, um, the debate between Mark Goodacre and Carrier, Goodacre doesn't argue these positions. It's they these are these are fundamentalist positions. Yeah. Um... I, I, I've been trying a strategy like for the last month or two of, and I'll call it a strategy, a tactic. Because, uh, you know, I'm just an atheist trying to lead people to hell. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to get across is we all have biases. And so, Christians, if you can, for an hour or two, um, just not care so much about Jesus loving you and you loving Jesus and that he died for your sins and took away your guilt and shame and all this wonderful stuff. If you could just like put that on a shelf for an hour or two and listen to what critical scholarship is saying about your own holy text, I, I can't help but think that if you're honest with yourself, I'm not saying that it's going to prove you wrong or anything close to that, but it's going to raise doubt in you. And I think doubt is good. Uh, because especially if you are wrong, uh, it will help you have belief revision. But I, I think I'm asking that question in vain because there's no way a Christian can put their love for Jesus on a shelf for an hour without thinking that God's frowning at them. Uh, do you know if if they say anything more here at the end? I don't remember, but. It's pretty close to the end of the group. Uh, right. What's sure. the availability? What, what have they written in this area, just for interested listeners? Uh, so the the book that Lydia came out with oh. uh, last year was called Hidden in Plain View, Undesigned Coincidences in the Gospels and Acts, which is basically taking uh, William Paley's work and also the work of J.J. Blunt into the 21st century in view of modern scholarship. So it's, it's a, a resource I would recommend checking out. Um, Jonathan, I got a question for you. Do you get a cut of uh, Lydia McGrew's royalties? I, I'm a chartered... <laughs> I'm a chartered financial analyst, and whenever there is um, a payment for referrals, I have to declare it openly and publicly. Uh, <laughs> I'm just wondering, uh, Jonathan, do you actually get kickbacks? I just, I'm not saying you do. I'm asking if you do. Also, uh, uh, there's uh, the, the blog of Lydia McGrew, which is uh, What's Wrong With The World. I think it's .com or .org. You can check that out. Um, so th those would be the resources I'd point people to. Great. And uh, in terms of your where people can find you, uh, there's obviously let's just still point out that Lydia McGrew is not a historian. Um, her work in Hidden in Plain View was not published. They they never got those arguments published under peer review via like an academic journal in an isolated case, um, you know, outside of the cumulative case. Um, well, I'm going to push. So, I'm going to push back on you here, Cam. Which I'm, is not to say you shouldn't go read it. You should go read it. You should go buy it. Even I'm going to say I'm going to push back on you and say that Lydia McGrew is a historian. If you define historian a certain way, and but then my 14 year old daughter is also a historian. Yeah, like if she's, I mean, I don't want to denigrate her as a scholar because, you know, I do think that she has a lot to teach us in terms of um, philosophy and she's obviously an expert in a certain period of literature from my understanding. Um, but she, to my understanding, doesn't really have um, published uh articles in the field of history she has published articles in philosophy and epistemology but you know that doesn't mean that she's not a historian it just means that um yeah you should be a little bit at least cautious and be willing to um listen to criticisms of that perspective from people who are actually historians like when i was a christian i remember hearing about the jesus seminar and having like literally having um a tightness in my chest like these people are so wrong these people these historians in the jesus seminar are saying jesus never said that and jesus never said this and i just i felt sorry for them or sorry as the canadians would say and i can't help but think and i could be wrong but lydia jonathan if you're listening to this i can't help but think you have that same attitude i used to have that these historians who who say these things 
these terrible things about the Gospels um, that you just like feel sorry for them that they're just deceived or or just so biased that they can't see the truth of Jesus. But no, I, I now when I look back on it, I just am ashamed of myself. And it's like these people are not out to do harm to anyone. They're they're doing their jobs, <laughs> and they come up with completely different conclusions as you guys. And why? I think I know why. I think I know why as well. I got to pick up my uh, my son for an orthodontist appointment soon. So, any final thoughts? Um, good on Jonathan for getting on with Carrier, and good on uh, Justin Briley for hosting the conversation on Premier Christian Radio, the unbelievable show. Justin, with a question if, mark. <clears throat> yeah, Justin, if you're listening to this. Uh, I, I hope we added enough value, maybe not value that you seem fit, uh, that, you know, we're not just plagiarizing you here, but um, your podcast. Uh, did you think Justin was fair to both sides evenly? Um, I think there are occasions where, like, maybe the the sort of limitations of the show meant that um, Carrier probably needed a better opportunity to you know add more content um and i think that justin does have a tendency to give um his the the guests that tend to agree with his position um more of an opportunity so for example he invited jonathan to give the apologetic about the we passages and acts um unprompted yeah and, I, yeah i remember that um, but, but I do think that, uh, you know, it's really admirable that they have this show and that they expose their Christian audience to alternate perspectives. Um, and I find that really brave and, and admire it. And usually he's a great host and he was on this occasion too. But. Yeah. And I actually, um, I like apologetics, Christian apologetics, because young people, especially who are listening to it, they're going to think of things that they never would have even thought to think about if it weren't for apologetics. And that alone is going to raise doubt in them. I think this is I, this is a point that I think most apologists don't appreciate. They don't get it. They don't get yeah. it, that they're actually, by going... It's dangerous. Deep, it's dangerous, yeah. By going deep into apologetics... You are actually, and for a certain, uh, there's a certain person I'm talking to right now out there in, in um, <laughs> the internets. Uh, there's certain people that this will cause apostasy. The, apo yeah, the, the apologetics definitely. alone will cause apostasy. I know of numerous people who, through their efforts to explore apologetics, actually encountered information that led to their deconversion. Anyhow, uh, I don't want Christians to become non-Christians. That's not my goal. My goal is just to be humble enough to say, you know what, I could be wrong. Richard Carey could be right on some things. Um, just have a little bit of doubt. That way, you know, you can be a little more humble. I and freely admit Jesus could be a real person and said some of the things he said in the New Testament. I'm mostly agnostic about it. I definitely, I definitely think it's very plausible that Jesus did exist and was a teacher of, of some form. Neil, thanks for everyone in chat. We had consistently close to 50 people for like, I think we were close to three hours. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, this is wow. Yeah, but it was fun. I actually had more fun than I thought it, I would because um, I already listened to it once. And so this was the second time. Uh, thanks again, guys. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.